Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And to the other members of the subcommittee, we're, we're all very grateful for your ongoing commitment uh, to human rights issues in Africa and, and throughout the world, as evidenced by your presence today and on your long-serving uh, support for the issues that, we're, that bring us together here today. Because my esteemed colleagues are covering a number of other issues related to the things we're covering today, I'd like to focus my time specifically on how to achieve the goals of this important hearing. So my, my focus is, my, my time is going to laser in on one aspect of the overall issue. The missing ingredient, I think, of the U.S. government's approach to countering repression in Africa and throughout the world, and that is how to build U.S. leverage needed to pressure leaders to stop brutally repressing basic freedoms of speech and assembly and religion. What possible levers of influence could the United States government utilize to support uh, the goals of this critical hearing topic? So I'm going to skip down to the bolded section on network sanctions and add a personal confession. As a, as a formal diplomat, a former diplomat and, and a reformed foreign policy expert, it took me decades to figure out what I'm going to tell you in the next five minutes. So let's start with something called network sanctions. Much, much more important than just using the term sanctions and utilizing the tool of sanctions. Why? Because those responsible for perpetrating conflict and targeting civil society in Africa have come to view sanctions as largely ineffective an underwhelming challenge to their hold on power when only a handful of individuals, without, usually without ties to, in, to the international financial system, are the ones being sanctioned. The reason is that sanctions regimes focused on this region lack the necessary ingredients, ingredients to make this tool effective. The idea that sanctions in Africa don't work is a product specifically of the design, the implementation of inf and enforcement of sanctions in Africa not the tool itself. To be effective, sanctions have to be levied against entire networks that enable these authoritarian regimes to oppress civil society, not just the individuals that are committing the abuses. Deploying these network sanctions has been the strategy that the United States has used in Iran and North Korea and other places to drive them to the negotiating table. The strategy has been bipartisan, it's extended over the last two administrations, perhaps you can argue even further back, and consistently relied on leadership and direction from Congress, which is the key point. Congress has driven the train on these issues so many times. The United States has deployed extensive sanctions, as you all know, targeting Iran's leadership and military networks in an effort to disrupt the illicit funding streams used by the country's ruling elites to maintain their grip on Iran's government and economy. In two cases, and this is very important because, again, we're talking about what Congress can do, in two cases, specifically using Executive Orders 13606 and 13628, these sanctions specifically focused on Iran's targeting of civil society. And I think these are important models to build from in order to ensure protection for civil society in Sub-Saharan Africa. They're important models because they focus on networks. Sanctions that target full networks in this way are powerful tools for changing behavior and pressuring targeted individuals to alter their behavior or come to the negotiating table. Network sanctions work because they affect not only the primary individuals themselves, but also those who are acting on their behalf and the companies that they owned or controlled by these primary individuals. If you go after the individuals, their networks, their companies, you, you, you sanction all of them at once or in close succession, an individual's network doesn't have enough time to absorb and adjust to the financial impact of being cut off from the U.S. financial system. And that is the precise outcome we're looking for. Shut them out of the international financial system. Try, if you have millions, if not billions of dollars in the international financial system, illicit uh, uh, gains, in real estate, in banks, and shell companies, try to do business if you can't access the banks. You will not be able to do it. This is the key approach to driving and changing behavior. We believe network sanctions would have a dramatic impact on protecting civil society in countries in Africa. And all, all these countries specifically 
where interlocking kleptocratic networks involving political and military officials, their business allies, arms dealers, and international financial facilitators, particularly in the banks, they profit from mayhem and they obtain technology from commercial partners that allow them to suppress their own populations. The U.S. Department of the Treasury, as well as its counterparts in the European Union and elsewhere, can go much further than what we've gone so far, escalating the financial pressures against entire networks in sub-Saharan Africa and those around the world that support them. Again, Congress leads the way. And I won't belabor the point because you all know it, but, and you champion it, Congressman Smith, but the Global Magnitsky Act gives us an incredibly potent tool. Now, the administration is overwhelmed. There's all kinds of stuff going on. They've, 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 they've got, they've got to now all these new efforts that are probably going to be taking, taking place related to Iran. They need congressional support and, and push and pressure to ensure that we can utilize these incredibly potent tools that are not being utilized now sufficiently for our goals, our shared goals in Africa. Now, the second interlocking tool, because sanctions simply aren't, network sanctions aren't enough, the, center, the second interlocking tool in a, in a sort of cocktail of, of more effective potential pressure and leverage that the United States could deploy in support of religious freedom and press freedom and uh, individual freedom is the full range of anti-money laundering measures that are available to the United States government. The increasingly effective use of these AML measures to focus on corrupt and criminal regimes around the world that are also targeting civil society, we can use these AML measures in Africa just as they've been used effectively in Iran and in North Korea and Burma and other places. Remember, when corrupt leaders or their business associates take bribes or they otherwise divert funds into their private accounts, then place those funds into the formal international banking system, usually in U.S. dollars, which gives Treasury a direct uh, 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 connection and, 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 and orbit, then that is money laundering. And our investigations and research have demonstrated that this is occurring across a number of countries in Africa. They route their money through neighboring countries and through using U.S. dollars and then into the international financial system. That means the U.S. government can act. We have the authority. You can use public advisories to banks. You can request through the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network at Treasury, FinCEN. You can send requests from FinCEN to thousands of banks on specific targets of interest. This forces the banks suddenly to look at these issues that they otherwise have just no interest in. So again, you, you, if you're going to impose sanctions, but no one's looking to where the money's going through the international system, they're useless. This is what we've been doing. Don't do it. It makes us look like a paper tiger just to impose sanctions without then working with the banks who are the getaway cars for all this stolen money. And this then creates that leverage that if we went after the money and if the banks were our allies in doing that, bringing pressure to bear specifically on the people that are looting these states and repressing these people. What's Congress's role? Well, as I said already, in many cases, I mean, look, this says 10 years, go back as long as we've known each other, Congressman Smith, whether on Iran, Russia, North Korea, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the most effective financial pressure measures have been imposed have been pressured and pushed and brought forth by Congress. Congress, and in particular this committee, and this subcommittee of this committee, has been steadfast in its commitment to the people of countries like Sudan, like Congo, South Sudan, many others that you have mentioned in, in your opening statements. It's time to bring those two elements together, anti-money laundering measures, network sanctions, and ensure that critical legislation related to these countries, and we know that there is efforts afoot right now on Congo, and that's exciting to hear that the uh, subcommittee and the committee are thinking about how they can move forward on a place like Congo, which is so fraught right now. Millions and millions of lives are at stake over what can happen in the, ne in the coming year around this electoral process. So Congress getting in the, in, 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 early on, in the, in the, uh, on the train tracks before there's a collision is utterly critical. The century, I'd like to just mention in, in my closing, is a, a piece of this. It's one of the in initiatives that I'm working on. Uh, 
you know, even if you have new authorities, and even if you use these authorities, we, we still don't have within the U.S. government because there's so much attention now, understandably, on Iran, and on North Korea, on countering terrorism and drug uh, trafficking, all the rest of it. What money is left to really do the kind of uh, uh, asset chasing, following the money of the, 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 the resources that are being stolen and looted out of Africa by the same people that are repressing these folks in, in the countries we're talking about today? So we started an initiative that puts together a team of, of law enforcement folks, intelligence, investigative journalism, corporate security, policy experts, all j jammed together, and we follow the money being looted from these resource-rich, war-torn countries in East and Central Africa. We haven't got the whole continent covered, but we're starting in, in, in the places where the conflicts are deepest. And we track where it ends up across the globe because nobody's stuffing their money under their mattresses. They're putting it in the international banking system and buying real estate and setting up shell companies and all the rest of it like everyone else does when they steal money around the world. So we're tracking that money, we're building dossiers, and we're turning that information over to the U.S. government, other governments around the world who can actually take action. And we're going to continue to do that, and we'd love to work more closely with this subcommittee to be able to make that happen. The bottom line is this. Condemning words are fine. We had a condemnation yesterday from the, from the, from the White House on South Sudan. That's important to, 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 to put the marker out there in words, right? But the issues that we're talking about today require serious action that impose serious consequences for the kind of actions that bring us together today in this, here, in this hearing. Follow the illicit money. Because those people that are looting the states are the same people that are committing these human rights abuses. That's their vulnerability. Go after it. We have not done that. Follow the illicit money, block it, freeze it, and seize it. And that will be the leverage to see improved human rights, at least from the U.S. government's perspective, improved human rights in Africa today. That's our view. Thank you very much for the time.